Hello, Jezu. Time for our third fireside chat with our no fire again. Um, someone commented that they liked my socks. These are my St. Ignatius Loyola socks. Um, two questions today. One really helpful um, for our prayer and spirituality during this difficult time, and the other kind of a complicated theological question. Um, so let me try to be brief and to put this in a way that makes sense. The first question really is this. Someone asked me, what do we have to believe? When a pope speaks, do we have to believe it? That's a particularly interesting question. Um, this week we're celebrating the fifth anniversary of Pope Francis's encyclical, Laudato Si, on the care for the earth, care for our common home. So it's good to think about that. When a pope says something, do we have to listen to him? Do we have to believe it? Let me back up. The idea of us as the people of God, the church as the people of God, is not a, it, that comes to us from the scriptures and all through the Old Testament, is about us being that salt and light for the world. We, our faith is not just individual, certainly our salvation is, and certainly how we live it, but we're supposed to be that group of people, those followers of Jesus, that inspire others to believe. And so it doesn't work really well when we don't believe ourselves or when we don't act that way. We should always try to let that Eucharist and the Word of God form us, that we become all of us, not just me and my house, but when we come to church, we form that community that makes, the, that gives the world a good example of who the disciples of Jesus are. Okay, so we should want to believe everything that the church teaches. We should desire it with our whole heart and whole soul. Now, most of us are human, well, we're all human, most of us struggle with our own sinfulness and weakness, and sometimes our faith life is a roller coaster. It's not a straight line. Sometimes it's easy to believe things, but sometimes when we struggle with suffering or something, belief becomes harder. And so it's, it's not as if our faith, we're all in or we're all out. Ideally, we'd all be in. But the reality of our lives isn't like that. Sometimes we struggle with faith for one reason or another, at one time of our life or another. And so we can't look at it as always, we're all in or we're all out, because honestly, no one's all in or all out at any given moment. Okay, what do we have to believe? Well, we have to believe the creeds. Um, and they come to us from the ecumenical councils. Those are the great church councils, the Council of Nicaea, the Council of, Nice uh, of Chalcedon, the Council of Ephesus, Trent, Vatican I, Vatican II. These are the highest teachings of the church. And so when we think of the Nicene Creed, or the, the Apostles' Creed, or the Ecumenical Councils, this is the highest teaching of the Church, and those are things that we should believe if we're Roman Catholics. Most of us believe them. Sometimes we might not feel Jesus as divine and human one way or another, but those are the essential elements of our faith. But then there are papal encyclicals, apostolic exhortations, apostolic letters, homilies. Where are those things? Well, first of all, we should all want to believe whatever the church teaches. So when a pope puts out an encyclical, that's the pope's highest teaching, other than declaring something infallible. The highest teaching, we should want to believe what's in the encyclical, and we should strive to believe it. These encyclicals don't come out, don't come out on a whim, where someone just writes something, a pope just writes it down and says, hey, try this. These are thought about, prayed, prayed over, talked about with theologians, we should strive to believe what a pope teaches in a papal encyclical. He brings his expertise in faith and in morals. Expertise most of us don't have. I certainly don't have it. And so we should want to believe everything that a pope puts out in an encyclical. The other kinds of things, there's apostolic letters and apostolic exhortations and teachings, are also important. We should want to believe it all. That should be our default, because what we want to be is those followers of Jesus that act as this, at this group, the people of God. I love the Spanish, el pueblo de Dios, the people of God that are that salt and light for the world, and we don't do that if we're all over the place. So we should want with our whole heart and our whole soul to believe what the church teaches. So a papal encyclical is something we should say, yes, laudato si. Some of us are divided on the issue of environmental in climate change. We should want to believe what the Pope says, and we should try to believe it with our whole heart and our whole soul. There might be parts of it that seem hard. Okay. 
for we should want to believe it and strive with everything to believe what the church teaches on all those things. Obviously, a homily is not the same as a, as a papal encyclical, or a homily isn't the same as the apostolic exhortation. But we should want to believe all of them as best we can, because we want to be that group of people, that city on a hill, that salt and light for the world, that inspires others. So on this anniversary of Laudato Si, let's try, read the document, papal documents are really hard to read by the way, um, but read the document, read parts of it, and strive to believe all of it, or as much as we can. I'm sure I'll have more to say on this topic as time goes on, um, because there will be more questions that probably already are, um, and this is a giant topic and I could go on and on, but I'll leave it there for now, I hope that's helpful. Um, if a Pope gives a good homily, I should say, wow, I should consider this. If a Pope writes an apostolic exhortation, I should say, oh, he's putting some weight on this. If a Pope writes an encyclical, he's saying, this is what we should strive with our whole heart and soul to believe. And of course, the creed and the and, uh, ecumenical councils are all things we should watch and believe with our whole heart, our whole soul, our whole mind, knowing that we're sinners. And life finds us like this in our faith life. So sometimes even things like Jesus' divinity or something like that, we may struggle with because of a personal thing, it's okay. That's the, that's the spiritual journey. Pray for the gift of the Spirit to be a believer. That's the best thing we can do. Okay, the second topic is um, spiritual communion in this time of pandemic. And um, what are we supposed to do? The Eucharist is so essential to our, our belief as Catholics. In fact, we wouldn't be here without the Eucharist. It's the Eucharist which drew the early Christians together, the followers of the apostles. It's the Eucharist which strengthened them. When they gathered in people's homes in those first, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80, 100, 200 years after Jesus, they celebrated the Eucharist. When they were facing persecution and fear, it was the Eucharist that gave them strength. This is who we are. The church grew out of that celebration of the Eucharist. You know, the Eucharist came before the New Testament even. That's shocking. It's true. And so this is core. Jesus has promised to always be with us truly in the Eucharist is what strengthens us, which gives us hope, forgives our sins, lets us know we're never alone when we suffer, when we're lonely, when we're abandoned. So how can we live these days without the Eucharist? It's, it's very challenging. It should be challenging anyway. So what is a spiritual communion? Well, it's a prayer that we hope that God is with us. I was trying to think of some really easy ways to think about this, and this is what I came up with. It meant work for you, I hope it does. It makes sense to me. We are a sacramental church. We believe that God touches us profoundly and truly in ways that are profoundly human. What do I mean by that? By through our senses. Hear, taste, touch, see, smell. That's, we believe God truly touches us, and the sacraments are, are profound embodiments of that sacramental theology. But as human beings, we relate to the world through our senses. Okay. So, when, for a, if you're a, a shut-in, and you never go, you can never get to Mass, what do you do? Or if you're in a mission country where Mass can't happen, for sometimes a long time, some of the early missions, the priests didn't come around but once a year. What did they do? This is kind of where we are right now. And here's how I think about it. Many of us are doing FaceTime and Zoom meetings and phone calls, okay? And we see our brother, our sister, our son, our daughter, our mother or father on a Zoom call or on FaceTime or on the phone. We feel their love. And it strengthens us when we can't see them. Zoom and FaceTime and Phone calls have been a godsend during this time. Imagine if we were in a pandemic without any of that. Very hard. We can feel the love when we hear that loved voice of a parent or a child or a friend. But it's not the same as hugging your mom or your son or your daughter or seeing your brother or sister. That tactileness that we are so human, we need that for that profound feeling, but it doesn't mean that when we talk to them on FaceTime or Zoom, that that love is not there. 
That's how I look at spiritual communion. Spiritual communion is like a Zoom call or a FaceTime in the sense of we can be there with Jesus. Jesus is always present. He doesn't need the sacrament to be present to us. The sacrament is like that tactile expression. Here I am. We can see, taste, touch, and smell. We hear the voice of of the, of the presider and the people singing at mass and the people saying amen and alleluia it makes Jesus so much more present to us in a tactile way just like a hug does versus a FaceTime call so spiritual communion is like a FaceTime call or a zoom call it's not the same as that hug that warm embrace that hearing that seeing that experiencing that tasting but it's also a real presence of love during this hard time, we pray that it might end soon, but let us realize that Jesus is always present to us in profound ways, and we long for that time when we can hear his voice in the Eucharist, when we can taste him with the bread of life and the cup of life. We can hear the singing of the people of God and the word proclaimed, and we can feel his profound closeness to us. I hope that helps. Kind of long today. Sorry about that. You guys are asking complicated questions. Keep those questions coming. This has been really good for me to do, makes me think a little bit, and I think it's a great way for me to reach out to all of you. God bless.